Now, I've covered a lot of the questions that I've sort of had. I, I'd be keen to open the f questions to the floor. Does anyone else want to contribute? Does anyone ha have a question for Abhijok? Anyone curious, anyone do work like this within their own communities um, and, and care to share? Truly inspiring. So thank you so much for sharing your journey with us. I was just curious as uh, hopefully a young person myself, um, what, what do you suggest ways are that um, young people can get involved um, in different areas that they're passionate about? Like what, what is the best avenue to pursue those, those passions? I think it would be starting at a point where you identify what it is you're passionate about and, and map out what's currently happening in that field, what's, what's existing. And if you see what is currently existing and it doesn't match with what it is you want to do, then maybe create it. Because if you're feeling that type of way, I mean, someone else also is. And they might be hesitant to create it as well. So I think it's, it's seeing what's currently existing and then maybe talking to them, navigating that field and talking to them, seeing if they um, are seeing what it is that you're seeing and then you can also work with them to be able to do that. Does anyone else have a question they'd like to ask? Thanks again for your um, fantastic insights, uh, Abhijok. I just wanted to um, gain some ideas as to how do you sustain motivation um, or enthusiasm um, for the works that you do? Um, especially when um, there are various challenges or barriers that come up um, in wanting to create change um, and bring about positive good in today's society? I think my biggest motivation uh, is the future generation. It's seeing my little nephew and my little niece and seeing the world that I want them to grow up in and not, um, not go through what I went through growing up. Um, it's taking my little nephew and niece to the park and um, seeing... A little, a little boy or girl run away from them, and my niece asking, "Why are they running away from me? I just want to play with them." And having to try and navigate, I don't want to have that discussion with her about um, racism or discrimination at any point. So it's about, okay, if I want to live in a world that is, I'm probably not going to be living in it myself, but for my <laughs> for the future generations to be living in a world where equality is the standard for all, um, it's about always speaking up and if I'm not sitting at that table um, raising them issues then who is and if I'm sitting at that table raising that issue have a look around the table and see who's voiceless who's not there who's currently not sitting at the table and why aren't they sitting there is it their security is it their safety what is the barrier that's hindering them from participating in that discussion that was a great question does anyone else want to contribute or, or sort of gain any insight from Apajok? Just from the other end of the age spectrum. <laughs> uh, I'm a All the welcome. <laughs> thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so I lecture uh, law to students that are undergrads, you know, and, and all, but that. And you did get me a little bit worried when you said that they're not more, you're more likely to listen to somebody your own age than an old buddy daddy like myself. You didn't use those words. <laughs> So I am wondering, because I do, one of the, I was just saying to somebody the other day that, look, if there's nothing else that my students get away, get from this course, it is to be good people. So I, I try to talk, I do talk a lot about ethics, and, um, and we actually do public intervention on war in a small way, but, uh, human rights, that sort of thing. But I guess what I'm asking you is that how can, it, you do give me good ideas, and I think, well, they really would rather be hearing from somebody their own age than me. Um, and they don't talk nearly as much as I like. As I do. Well, as these young ladies in front of me just said it. Um, they probably don't, you know, embarrass about saying the wrong thing. Um, probably more to me than to themselves. So I guess I'm just, maybe they're just comments, but maybe your thoughts on how do I get them more engaged? I think it's having that discussion with them at the start, saying, hey, um, how would you 
like to be more involved and how would you like to be engaged in this discussion? Because we're both going to be here whether we like it or not and let's make it as pleasant as possible. Um, so it's having that discussion because maybe they would rather um, sit in a group setting or go through case studies or find a different approach to that education of what they want to learn. Um, yeah, so I think it's, it's having that first and foremost discussion with them because I, I know it won't change what you're teaching them but it will change how you might go about it. What did you feel when, when you were studying social work? What did you feel worked? When was it that you're like, snore? And when were you like, yeah, this is, this is great? Actually, ethics was like one of my favourite units. Um, and it was because, OK, um, the theories we would read at home before we get to school, before we got to uni. But um, in class, it was all case study based. So we would be looking at this example. It's, it's a real life example. And if this happened, what would, your, what would be your response? And we're living in the now. Um, and that was just what worked for me. Does anyone else have a question? You don't have to be young. <laughs> um, Abigail, you um, mentioned about a teacher at school that encouraged you to go to a leadership course and how that sort of made a difference in your life. Um, encouraging you to do that. And then at the same time, you said, um, well, as young people, we, you know, often like to hear from young people. Do you think there's a role for older mentors supporting yes. young people? And what do you think that role is? A hundred percent. I have, I've had several mentors and I don't think I could be doing the advocacy that I do without the mentors and um, having them live through it themselves and they know the system. Um, if I had been given the scholarship to go to Geneva and represent um, all refugee youth from Australia and New Zealand without that mentorship and that support, I probably wouldn't have spoken a word. Um, they were the ones who were like, hey, you need to be here and there's a reason why you're here and this is how the system works here. And it's having that ongoing support because without that support, there's no way young people can actually utilise the spaces that are being given to them to the full of their capacity without having that support from mentors themselves. So there's a place for everyone, I think. Yes. <laughs> um, does anyone else want to contribute to the discussion? Hi, panel. Um, Aaron J. McKechnie. Um, talking about money, and money um, is important. Um, how do you, how can you get money to fund these important issues? In what way? So, in advocacy or in fundraising or all addressing issues? All of the above. Yeah. Um, okay. So. I mean, a lot of it is. Um, volunteer, uh, charity based, but um, money does help, but, um, it's, yeah, it's, it's hard. <laughs> Yeah, so, so talk, talk us, you mentioned um, you considered applying for grants and you mentioned then getting support from other community organisations that were willing to loan venues to you. Um, I guess maybe elaborate on that a little bit, how, how Pivotal is getting that funding and how do you, how do you fundraise for um, the work you do with Voices of Salvation and I guess any of the other work you've done? What are some of those practical things you can do to, I guess, get that capital you need? I think... Um the way we started was more, this is urgent, let's put down whatever we've got and then see who else can support us to make it happen. But moving forward, it was more of a matter of, um, we will provide catering um, and with that, we'll have an entry fee of $5. That will go to ongoing um, supports for us to book further venues because there's no guarantee that every venue is going to just be given to us. Um, that was just the initial stages. And I think um, moving forward, it was a matter of if we have space and time, then we can apply for funding. Um, and because we were such a new organisation, not many funding bodies would actually want to give us um, money. So it was about finding the local organisations that are willing to auspice um, the project that it is that we want to do. Um, and at that international level with the advocacy, uh, UNHCR has a funding pool um, where 
NGOs and other governments can apply for that funding to... Sorry? Oh, sorry. An NGO is um, a not-for-profit um, organisation. So um, if a not-for-profit organisation wants to go to Geneva and advocate about what they're passionate about, then they can apply for funding from UNHCR and UNHCR make that funding so you can bring a representative. So um, not the staff per se, but maybe one of the clients, one of your clients or someone from a refugee background who accesses your service and they'll sponsor that person to go. Anyone else? Yeah, thank you, uh, Project, for your wonderful uh, talk and your background. It's amazing how much work you've done in such a short uh, career. Um, and uh, anyway, when we started, I want to talk about us and them, because us and them is something that uh, uh, this country has experienced all throughout the 100 years that we've uh, existed or so. Uh, you know, back then, us and them, us were the whites, Australians, and them were the originals, and eventually us became the Anglican Church of England and then became Catholics yeah, yeah. and us became uh, the Christians and then became the Muslims and, yeah. and us now becomes the white Australian and then is the Africans who've come to this country recently. This has been a historical thing in this country unfortunately and uh, yeah. but we always overcome these obstacles eventually and people do uh, embrace each other. When we formed Affinity back in 2000 that was the reason we formed. We were Muslims um, we uh, we were a minority, and we were, you know, seen as terrorists. As uh, 2001 September 11 events occurred, maybe you weren't born then, but uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, these things, uh, uh, I mean, that's not the only reason we started, but we wanted to also integrate the Muslim community into Australia. We want to help be the the vehicle to for that integration. Mm. And uh, after 20 years has elapsed, we've, uh, we've achieved a lot. Uh, we've, uh, we, we've done it because we, uh, we believed in what we, uh, what we had, you know, had a vision at that time. So 20 years ago, I was uh, not as young as you, but I was, uh, I was with a, few, a group of young guys and girls, and uh, we uh, changed uh, the way um, Muslim societies existed, and Muslim people existed in this country. Uh, Muslims in those days would be isolated in their pockets, uh, yeah. in their suburbs, and they would also um, have meetings with male-dominated organisations, female-dominated organisations, but never together. <coughs> and uh, and all the, the discussions and meetings would be in the language that they came from, the ethnicity, mm. the Arabic or Turkish or whatever. So uh, these things. Uh, it took a long time to get, get to that, and, and we've now integrated the Muslim community as much as we can to, to uh, Australia. What are some of the vision that you have for that integration work to integrate the African community to Australia? I think it would be starting with sporting clubs. Uh, so a lot of um, young people might not have... Um, so a lot of young people in our community have single mother households where um, there's a huge form of guilt for living in Australia while um, other half of your family is living back home. So um, most of your income you're sending it back home to financially support or put other cousins and relatives, extended family through education. So a lot of young people um, don't have the financial capabilities to go to um, a local football club. Um, so they'll just go to their local park together um, with their cousins and their siblings or even just their neighbours and just kick the ball around. And I think it's about finding opportunities where we could provide s scholarship for young people to be integrating into the local sporting clubs um, because sport is a commonality and there would really it's really a great starting point for that. Um, but I also think in the wider community it's a matter of having that discussion. Um, like you said, the communities that came before us have gone through this. So it's learning from your own experiences and how we could be um, working together and getting that advice, almost like a mentorship approach, getting that advice about what worked for you um, 
when it happened to your community and how could we, we be working towards doing that now um, ourselves? Well, I think we've reached um, our, the end of our discussion. Thanks so much for joining us today, Abhijok. I, I really liked your caramel slice analogy, so I think that's something everyone will take away. You need young people engaged in the conversation if you want to influence uh, their lives and, and create change. I'd like to um, invite Birak Alpay, Projects Officer at Affinity Intercultural Foundation, to the lectern to provide the finishing remarks.